everybody, and welcome to Cold Springs Church Online. Thank you so much for joining us, however you are joining, however you're watching. We are just so glad that you are with us this morning. We're going to start our time off with a song of worship and praise to our great God together. So I just invite you to sing along with us as we praise Him.
Hey, my name's Nick, and it is great to be with you here this morning, Sunday, October 11th. I'm so glad you joined us as we continue our series, Unshakable. Uh, Pastor David's going to be bringing the message in just a little bit. We are so excited to be meeting back together in person on campus. Uh, we've been doing it for a couple weeks, and next week we have a big shift is that we're going to be going back uh, into the uh, two service times. We're going to have our 9 o'clock service and our 1045, and during the 1045 service, uh, we're going to have our Kids World opening back up. So we encourage you to come check that out. Uh, reconnect with our Kids World Ministry. They are so excited to see you and they have prepared and worked so hard to be able to open back up and be ready to serve uh, kids and families in our community here at Cold Springs Church. You know, one of the things that we love to do each fall, the past several years, it's been an amazing time, has been trunk or treat. And this year we're, we're gonna shift just a little bit uh, and we're calling it Fall Family Fun drive Through Event. And our Kids World people have been working hard to put together just just uh, be an incredible blessing to the families here at Cold Springs and in our community. But what we need people to do is to make sure to sign up and register online because they're actually going to make a package for each individual kid. And it's just going to be a tremendous blessing. So make sure you check out coldspringschurch.net and sign up for that. And our children's ministry, Kids World directors, uh, Sylvia and Charlotte, want to share just a little bit more with you about that. Hi, this is Sylvia and Charlotte, and we are here with bad news. Trunk or treat is not happening. But the good news is, John 8, 12 says, I am the light of the world. So come and join us for a fall family fun drive through October 31, 6.30 to 7.30, here in the church's parking lot. Come dressed up, dress your family up and get in the car and you can even dress your car up for the parade and come on over to Cold Springs Church. We'd mm -hmm. love to see you. And you can help in shining the light that night by signing up online for our Operation Christmas Child and getting a box and filling it with things for children in other countries who would really like to be blessed. Mm -hmm. So not only can you shine a bright light on a dark night, you can share a bright light on a dark night. See you then. Bye.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have to worship you, to praise you, to proclaim these songs of truth. And God, no matter what our week has looked like, no matter what our future is going to look like, may we know that no matter what comes our way, God, that you are for us. There is nothing better than your love and your grace that surrounds each and every one of us. So may we press into that today, this week. God, we love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Welcome, Cold Springs Church. We are so glad that you have joined us today to worship and to engage with Jesus. Would you pray with me as we prepare to open up our Bibles and to learn from Jesus today from the Sermon on the Mount? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the um, presence that you bring to our lives in the midst of the challenges and the difficulties. Um, thank you so much for the blessings that you pour out upon us each day that um, sometimes we have the eyes to see, but whether we see them or not, the, the reality is, is that you meet us in every moment of our lives. And Jesus, thank you for this community that we are a part of, um, the community that is gathered in this one place of um, Placerville, California, but the community that is gathered um, virtually throughout the world. And Lord, I pray that um, you would um, meet us in this day and in this time. Uh, that you would speak to us, um, that our hearts would be tender to your spirit and to your words, um, and that you would bring healing and hope and life to us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. It was almost 30 years ago, um, but I can still very much remember pretty vividly walking up those steps to my friend Bob's apartment in order to help him to pack up his uh, belongings and to move them into my car and then eventually to move them into my house with Pam and I. As Bob moved out of his apartment that he was living with his wife um, and moved in to us, uh, with us. You see, um, Bob and, and his wife, uh, were great people, and they had been missionaries in Central America, and Bob and I had met in seminary where they had transitioned to come and to receive uh, further theological training at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and yet in the midst of that, there was tremendous brokenness. And for a long time, their marriage had been unraveling, that there had been a lot of difficulty, a lot of challenge in their marriage and in their relationship, reaching to this point on this day where I was helping Bob to move out of his home and move into our home. You know, the, today we're, we're talking about this passage in, in Matthew chapter 5, um, where Jesus talks about divorce. And we've been dealing with some pretty heavy things over the last few weeks. And I think I you know, commented last week of like, wow, you know, I sure wish Jesus had something relevant to say in the world we live today, that we were talking about anger and, and the impact of racism and discrimination um, you know, three weeks ago, and then last week we were talking about um, uh, the the challenge of lust and of adultery and um, th all of those things that go on with uh, sexual ethics, and and then this week we're talking about divorce and what Jesus and what the Bible has to say about divorce. And in Matthew chapter five through seven, Jesus is is teaching us what it means to be a kingdom person. What does it mean to have a kingdom perspective in the, in the life and in the world that we're leaving or that we're living? And in my story of my friend Bob and, and, and his wife eventually ended up uh, getting divorced and he lived with us during that process and we were able to walk with him and be with him through this really painful and difficult time in his life. Um, that 
you know, th that left a, a mark <laughs> on him. It left a mark on her. It left a mark on, on us in, in walking through that journey with them and with him. You know, um, my sort of personality is, is that I want to live an, an adventure full life. And, and God has blessed me and I've been able to do that. But the thing is, is about when you're living an adventureful life, uh, a life of adventure, it leaves a mark. You know, it leaves a mark like when you're on the adventure where you're uh, camping with your young uh, kids and you happen to reach across the chopping block when your son is uh, about ready to chop a piece of wood and he hits the, your, the axe on your elbow. Um, it leaves a mark, <laughs> just so you know. There's a mark there. There's a scar where I can say, oh, yeah, that's where Keenan hit me with an axe. Um, or, you know, when I was in high school, sliding in, you know, into the snow, snow towards somebody and not realizing that there was a rock underneath the snow there and that rock hitting my knee and putting a hole in my uh, knee so that you can sort of see and look in there. It's like, oh, you know, that leaves a mark. Uh, just earlier this summer, uh, when I was backpacking with my son and, and stepping through the snow and, and falling down and tearing a, a, a tendon in my shoulder. So now I actually have four marks on my shoulder where that tendon had to be reattached in, in the process of, of rehabbing from that. When we live a life of adventure, when we just live, the challenge is, is that the reality is, is that it leaves a mark. Now, and there's a, there's a challenge in being married, and that's where I want to start as we talk about, and as we begin to look at this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus um, addresses the whole issue of, of marriage and divorce. And, you know, it's a challenge to be married. <laughs> that's, that's sort of the reality. If you talk to anybody, you know, who is married or has been married, you're like, yeah, there's lots of challenge to that. And I would say the vast majority of people don't enter into a marriage with the plan that, well, you know what, I'm just going to get divorced. Um, that's not, the, that's not the, the mindset that you go into a marriage because it's almost a um, foregone conclusion. If that's the way you're entering in, then that's probably might be where you're going to um, end up. There's a comedian, Tom Papa, and, and he does this comedy show called You're Doing Great. And at the end of his comedy show, he, he talks about this whole thing of marriage and, and that when you're dating, you know, that the, the dating when you're young and you're, you're looking at that other person, that, that man or that woman, he reminds us, he says, you're looking at the showroom model. You know, the showroom model is you know, designed to move the product off the shelf, right? And he says, what you have to do is you have to go 30 years. You have to think about 30 years from now. What is that person going to look like? What are they going to be like 30 years from now? Because that's who you're going to be living with um, when you enter into this, this relationship, when you enter into this marriage. You see, the reality is, is that when we enter into marriage, um, that there's a connection that happens. And we talked about this that last week a bit with the, the whole thing of that when a man and woman join together in sexual union, there's a, a connection that, that happens there physically. But that it's not just physical connection. There's an emotional connection that happens. There's a spiritual connection that happens. There's a, an, an, an intellectual, there's a mind connection that happens. I don't know if you've ever been around maybe a couple who's been married for a long time. They sort of begin to finish their sentences or they remind each other of what they were talking about, you know, the, those sorts of things going on. It's like, okay, these two people have lived together for a really long time. Yeah, they're two different people, but they're, you know, they've been connected and that connectedness comes out and it, and it shows. Um, and so it's in that context that Jesus gives this, this teaching about, um, about marriage and, and about divorce. And, and there's actually a couple places but, uh, where Jesus talks about this. And, and I want to go to Matthew 19 first um, and read to you where uh, Jesus gives sort of the ideal. He says, some Pharisees came and tried to trap Jesus with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? And haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied. They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. 
Since they are no longer two, but one, let not one, no one split apart what God has joined together. So Jesus is going back into Genesis chapter 2, and he's giving us this, this picture of, of marriage that it is um, not just two people living in the same space and occupying the same space, but there is a, an intimacy, there's a unity, there's a oneness that takes place. And that oneness, that unity, that intimacy th that, is, that happens in marriage or is designed to happen in marriage from a biblical perspective is also the image and the picture that is used throughout the Bible of our relationship with God. And we talked again a bit about that, of this metaphor of marriage being a, a thread that runs throughout Scripture to point us to and to show us, to give us this physical, you know, earthly picture of the spiritual union that we have with God, of our connection and our unity with God. And it's, it's a picture of God's covenant love toward his people. And that we're living that out as we live out our marriages. We're living that out in the world around us. And it's also the metaphor of the unity of Jesus and the bridegroom, who, who's the bridegroom, and the, his church, who is the bride. And the, the book of Revelation, at the end of the book of Revelation, is about this big marriage feast where the bride and the bridegroom come together. Um, and it's the church and Jesus in this great celebration that takes place um, of, of this connection. And the picture of sexual union between difference, you know, people who are different of a man and a woman, um, to then become one, which is something new, no longer individuals but a couple, um, that's, a, that's a new identity that is, is found in that couple coming together of, of a family that is beginning to be made. And it's, that's a, a metaphor, that's a picture as well, is, is that when we uh, unite our lives with Christ, when we unite our lives with Jesus, that there is something new that happens. There's a new creation that takes place through his um, grace. And the, that we have this unity that, with Jesus, and that unity is modeled in the church. It's, uni, it's modeled in our faith of, of being connected to Jesus as we live in this world as people. And the thing that, that Jesus is, is going to teach us and he's going to remind us and tell us is, is that when when we live outside of God's best, when we live outside of God's design, the thing that happens is, is that leaves a mark. That, you know, that's not just an adventure life, leaving a mark of stretching ourselves, but the brokenness of the world, the brokenness of, of life around us, it leaves a mark. And there's nothing that, you know, I think, um, you know, can leave a mark quite like the brokenness that happens with divorce. Now, within the United States, you know, here's some of the statistics, you know, 40 to 50 percent of marriages in the U.S. end in divorce. Um, and, you know, that number, you know, sort of can float back and forth there a little bit. But just, you know, sort of when you think about people, you know, in 2018, there were more than 782,000 divorces and annulments in, in the United States. So if you think about that, it's like, okay, well, you have to, 782,000, you actually have to double that of, as a minimum of the number of people that it's affecting, right? Because a marriage is two people. So that's 1.5 million people who were impacted in 2018. Now, if each of that, that couple has children, then you have to add all of those in. So you can easily say, well, you know, there's probably two to, you know, two million people in 2018 were personally impacted, affected by divorce. The poverty rate for uh, custodial mother families or where the, the mother has the children is more than 29% in 2015. Um, and that's the difference between if the father is the custodial father, if the, if the father is the one who has the children, then about 17% are in the poverty rate, live in, in the poverty rate. 
And the LA Times um, reported that divorced women over 50 uh, years of age, they experience a 45% drop in their standard of living um, compared to a 21% drop for men over 50. And, and so, you know, just in our culture, in our world, when we think about divorce, it has tremendous impact. It has tremendous influence upon on women in particular, upon children, upon everybody who's engaged and who's involved. It leaves a mark. In order to, to understand what Jesus is saying, we, we need to understand the world that he's speaking into, right? Um, that's one of the things that we sort of have continually come back to in this series is trying to understand the context of, of Jesus and the people he's talking to and the world he's talking about it. And the, the Hebrew world that Jesus would have been spoken, speaking into was hugely influenced by the Roman and, and Greek culture that was so prominent uh, within their world. And amongst the pagans, uh, marriage and, and sexual faithfulness between a married couple um, was, was a pretty loosely adhered to. It wasn't something that was held at a real high value. And that women had very few rights, um, and men were mostly free and even encouraged to enjoy sexual liaisons outside of marriage, um, to, to do whatever they wanted with whomever they wanted, whenever they wanted to. Um, and so that's the culture, the Greek and Roman culture, that the, the people that Jesus is speaking to are living in and amongst. And that would have influenced the world that they were a part of. And... And, and Greek and Roman philosophers um, even went on record of saying this, uh, Demosthenes um, is recorded saying this, we have courtesans for the sake of pleasure, we have concubines for the sake of daily cohabitation, we have wives for the purposes of having children legitimately and of having a faithful guardian for all our household affairs." So that was a bit of the attitude of the Greek and Roman culture of the day that Jesus is speaking into. It's like, well, you know, uh, if you're a guy, then, you know, you have um, the courtesans that you can, you know, have for sexual pleasure. And then you have concubines that you can, you know, just have sex whenever you want. And then you, but you have a wife who you have children with, you know, and she takes care of the household. You know, it's, it's, it was a little bit of a, you know, challenging environment, a little bit of a, a, a bit of a messed up environment, particularly if you're talking about uh, the idea of intimacy and connection and love in marriage. So it's into that context that Jesus says this, you have heard it said, Matthew 5, 31, you have heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. Okay, so Jesus is starting, again, using this little formula that he, that he has, of you have heard it said, so, so conventional wisdom, teaching that you are hearing from the, the, the Pharisees, scribes, teachers of the law, this is what they're saying, that um, you can divorce your wife with just giving her a certificate of marriage, that's what you've heard, and then he's going to come back with that to say, okay, there's something about your heart. There's something else you need to understand in this. Now, when we look at this, even within last week of how Jesus and how Paul taught about marriage and about a husband's responsibility and a wife's responsibility uh, towards one another and this idea of mutual submission that they were to live under, it was an extraordinarily countercultural a message within the, both the Jewish world and the Roman and Greek world that they were a part of. And what Jesus is saying here is equally uh, counter-cultural. It's extraordinarily pro-women. Is that Jesus' um, his teaching should be seen from the perspective of one who is speaking on behalf and being an advocate for the, the oppressed. And in this case, the advocate for women. You see, when Jesus is, is doing his teaching, there were two primary schools of thought um, led by two prominent uh, uh, Pharisees, two prominent teachers uh, about this whole area of divorce. So one of those was Shammai um, school, was very strict and austere, 
And then the other was the Hillel school was more liberal and generous and broad-minded. So the Shammai school said that the definition of indecency was sexual immorality um, or adultery. So the, the, the cause for divorce, indecency on the part of a woman, in particular, it only went one way, um, was is that that indecency was is that there was sexual immorality or, or adultery. And that was the only grounds for legitimate divorce. But then there was another school of thought, the Hillel, on the other hand, suggested a man could accuse his wife of indecency um, if she did various things. And so these are the things that, that a wife would do that would, would be indecent and would be grounds for divorce, according to the Hillel school. Spoiling her husband's dinner by putting too much salt in it. Talking to men in the streets. Being troublesome and quarrelsome. Going out in public without her head covered. Or speaking disrespectfully of her husband's parents. All of those were grounds for being indecent for divorce. And then another famous rabbi that came on um, years after the time of Shammai and Hillel, um, they suggested, uh, he suggested a cause of indecency as grounds for divorce might be that a man finds another woman whom he considers to be more attractive. And so you're essentially, your wife isn't attractive enough, that is indecency, therefore she can be divorced. You know, so when you look at, at, at Jesus' words where he says, you have heard it said that a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce, that word merely there is actually sort of a, a translational, you know, word that's put in in the New Living Translation to sort of emphasize this fact of like, man, this is just, this is sort of wanton. This is, this is um, unfeeling and unthinking in, of how a man can go about divorce and to see marriage. Dallas Willard, in talking about the, the challenge for women within the culture that Jesus is speaking into, he said that for women, there were only three realistic possibilities in Jesus' day. One, she might find a place in the home of a generous relative, but usually on grudging terms as a, a little more than a servant. Two, that she might find a man who would marry her, but always as damaged goods and sustained in a degraded relationship. Or three, she might finally make a place in a community as a prostitute. And, and he continues, he says, society would not then, as ours does today, support a divorced woman to any degree or allow her to support herself in a decent fashion. I was reading a story uh, in the Bible in John chapter 4. Um, it's a story about the, Jesus uh, waiting for his disciples to go get some food, and he's waiting at a well in Samaria. And a Samaritan woman comes out um, to, uh, in the middle of the day in order to get water. And she's by herself. And so the, all of those things sort of set up the story to say, okay, there's something going on with this woman that she would be out in the, in the heat of the day to get water, that she would be by herself because it was something you did with other women and it would be something you would do at the beginning of the day or the end of the day, not when it's hot, mo, uh, most hot. And so Jesus has this interaction, this conversation with her. And at one point, this is what he says to her in verses 16 through 18. He says, go and get your husband. And the woman responds and says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says this to her. He says, you're right. You don't have a husband for you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Now, this is, a, this is not the main point of the story, but what you see here is, is that you see the impact of divorce on this woman. Is that, is that she has had six husbands and now she's just living with somebody in order to survive. And so how was she seen within that community? How was she seen by all of these different men that are there? You have heard it said, Jesus says, that a man can divorce his, his wife by just merely giving her a certificate of divorce. He says, but I say to you, but I tell you, in verse 32, 
But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. You know, let's be honest. Those are some really hard words. <laughs> Those are some really hard words. So, you know, what do we do with these words of Jesus? Well, one of the things I think that we have to understand here is, is that Jesus is upholding the high view of marriage. That Jesus is, is communicating in this is that we should not be casual about our marriages. We should not be casual about our relationships that we have where we are connected Sexually connected, physically connected, emotionally connected, intellectually mind connected. This is that that connection is like super glue that that that, that binds our lives together, and that that is much greater than just a physical thing. It's much greater than the convenience of having lower rent and sharing rent and sharing expenses and and having you know double income or whatever it is. But there's an intimacy, there's, there's something that we are invited into that is a thing of beauty, it's a thing of power. There's something that we're invited into that's bigger. And, and so um, the other thing is, is that as we look at these words of Jesus is also to recognize that there are things that can break a marriage. Now, in this other teaching that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 19, uh, um, in chapter 19, verse 8, this is one of the things he said. He said, Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. Again, this, this picture of marriage is, is that, of, of entering into this covenant of love that is lasts as long as we live, till death do us part, you know, that, that word there. But the reality is, is that there are things that can break a marriage. And that in God's grace, there was this concession that Moses gave because of the hardness of people's heart, because of the brokenness that happens in people's lives. And we see that today. And, and here within the scripture, the, the thing that is, is being taught is, is that one of those things that breaks a marriage is sexual infidelity, is, is unfaithfulness. Now, it doesn't have to lead to divorce. I've seen some amazing and been a part of some amazing stories of restoration where this has been a part of a marriage of sexual infidelity, where adultery has happened. So it doesn't have to go there, but I'll tell you what, it, it leaves a mark. You see, and the thing is, is that divorce leaves a mark. There are consequences. Um, and that's the other thing that, that Jesus is, is saying in this, is that when you go down that, that path of divorce, and there are consequences, it leaves a mark. And, and that's, you know, it's like stating the obvious. I mean, talk to anybody who has been impacted or affected by divorce in their life. And it's like, of course it does. You know, that connection of marriage, of body and soul, emotion and mind, when that is, is torn apart, we don't just come apart cleanly, that there are, are pieces that are left on each other that are there. And, and divorce, ultimately, it forces people to live outside of God's best. God's best is, is, that, is that there would be intimacy, that there would be um, connection, there would be health. There would be a, a synthesis of, of lives that would bling, bring blessing to them and also be a, a fountain of blessing in the world. But we know that that's not always the case. That can be a challenge. You know, the other thing is, is that what, what divorce does is it, it puts people at the crossroad of bitter road 
and better road. It puts people at the crossroad of bitter road and better road. Because there's this tearing that happens, because when that connection ends, you know, there's, there's these choices that, that have to be made. And you know that the statistics for divorce for first marriages, you know, that 40% or so, that's pretty, that's pretty harsh. But when you go to second and third and beyond marriages, I mean, it, it gets worse. You're like, well, what, what's up with that? Well, I, I got to be honest with you. I've been around in, in, with a number of people who I've seen in their lives that, that they have allowed bitterness to destroy them and they have allowed bitterness to impact and affect their children and, and the people around them. And it's, it's caused a tremendous amount of challenge and pain. So what's the D word? Well, the D word isn't necessarily divorce. The D word is damaged. You know, that... that Divorce brings damage. But the question is, is that does that mean that we are damaged goods? You know, my friend Bob, when he was, um, when he got divorced, um, he was excommunicated uh, from his church by his pastor in Texas. And, you know, although divorce is, is more and more common, there still is this huge stigma that is attached to it, can be attached to it within the church. And, and it's, a, it's a tension because in, in the church, as, as followers of Jesus, we're to live towards and we're to, to pursue and to hold up the ideal of, that Scripture teaches of, of, of God's best. And yet, here's the reality is, is that we're broken people. We live in a broken world. And we bring our brokenness to bear sometimes most, oftentimes most, if not always most, in those who are closest to us. So we need the work of grace. We need the work of grace. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 through 5, um, it's towards the end of the story, towards the end of the book. You know, God's sort of wrapping things up. It's this picture of his restoration in the world. And this is what it says. It says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down. For what I tell you is trustworthy and true. You see, the work of Jesus, what we see there is we see that completed work of Jesus, of restoring, of making everything new. But you know, when Jesus came and he lived on this earth and he died on that cross and three days later he was resurrected to the right hand of God where he intercedes for his, his followers moment by moment to the ear of God. That Jesus, when he came to this earth, he started something new. He began to restore that which was broken. He set the captives free. He opened the eyes of the blind. He gave hope that this isn't all there is. There is so much more and that there will be a day when everything is made new. And we get that picture there in Revelation, in the book of, of Revelation Jesus came to set you free. Jesus came to restore you and me to his intended design, to the intended blessing that we were to have. So how, are do, we, how do we live? How do we live with this brokenness that, that we all carry and, and that we're all a part of and in this world that is broken? Well, one is, is that we, we need to be people who walk with people in grace. 
We need to walk wherever people are in grace. When people struggle, when marriages are struggling, we need to be people who walk in grace and truth in that situation, upholding God's desire for restoration and healing and renewal and hope within that marriage, within that relationship. But we also need to be people of grace and walk with people in grace when things get broken because things break. That we can still be a person of grace, pointing people to Jesus. And you know, if you are somebody who has been impacted and affected by, gra- by divorce, then you're need- you need to be somebody who is receiving grace. You know, we all live with the D word. He says, are you damaged goods? I'm damaged goods. We're all damaged. This world leaves a mark. And that there are marks that are left in, in, you know, in, in a marriage that, that dissolves or disintegrates a relationship. It is hard. It leaves a mark. It, it brings damage into our lives. But you know what? You're not irredeemable. I'm not irredeemable. We are not irredeemable. And what we we have to remember is that our past is not the thing that defines us. It's the presence of Jesus Christ in our life that defines us. Our past and the the past hurts and, and, and mistakes of those that we, you know, are married to or been married to, They are not the thing that define us. Your mistakes are not the thing that define you. Jesus Christ in your life is the thing that defines you. The journey of the follower of Jesus is to find and in ever-increasing measure live as the beloved of God. You know, at Cold Springs Church, we talk about, you know, being a follower of Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus, that a disciple of Jesus is someone who follows Jesus in an ever-deepening relationship with God and an ever-deepening relationship with others. That's living as a beloved and living out of the beloved, that Jesus is the most important thing. So here's the, here's the question for you that we come to at the end of our message today is, is that what is it that you need to surrender to Jesus in order to be the person of grace and to receive the grace that he wants? What is it that you need to surrender? How do you need to follow Jesus? What do you need to listen to? Where do you need to begin to live the words of Jesus, to do the words of Jesus, that you can experience his grace, his freedom, and his restoration. Because you know what? Your marriage, can, it, 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 it has that possibility. If Jesus is at the center of each of your lives, and you put Jesus in the center of your marriage. I know it's hard. And it has that possibility. It has that ability. If you are a life that has been touched, and, and you are damaged by divorce in your life and in your story, is that Jesus has come to make all things new. That there is freedom and there is restoration and there is hope in Jesus. And it comes through surrendering to Jesus. That you have the power to choose whether you're going to go down bitter road. And remember, we can make our choices, but we can't choose our consequences or whether you're going to go down better road and experience the grace of Jesus and the healing and the hope that is found with him. And here's one of the things I want you to know is that we will walk with you. We will be with you. We will be with you. As Jesus will even more so be faithfully with you. If the Son sets you free, You are free indeed. That is the promise of Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for um, your word that holds up the beauty and the picture of what our Heavenly Father 
intended for our marriages to be. And thank you for your grace that meets us in our brokenness, in the damage that we have done and that has been done to us to give us a hope and to give us a future. And thank you that we can receive grace and also that we can be your grace to our friends, to our family members, so that they can experience the restoring grace that you offer. Lord, I pray that you would make us, Cold Springs Church, a place and a people of your restoring and renewing grace. It's in your name, Jesus, that I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. We just ask that you would please continue to stay connected with us on our website, coldspringschurch.net, and Facebook and Instagram. All you have to do is search Cold Springs Church. If you are able to in this time and call Cold Springs Church your home, now is the time to be generous to the mission that Cold Springs is on together. You can do this by going to our website, coldspringschurch.net slash give, or you can text the amount you'd like to give to 84321. We're going to end our time of worship with a song, so no matter where you are at, we encourage you to sing along with us as we close our time together.